freedom of the press is still guaranteed by the First Amendment to the Constitution, but journalists today have been facing an unprecedented wave of attacks, including from the nation's commander-in-chief, who called the news media the enemy of the American people. Here in the United States and abroad, journalists are finding themselves in uncomfortable and sometimes downright dangerous situations as they simply work to do their jobs. In fact, some have suffered physical attacks at protests and rallies. The Radio Television Digital News Association, RTDNA, has been on the front lines in the fight to protect the rights of journalists. Earlier this year, RTDNA launched a First Amendment task force. So I'm so very pleased to have with us RTDNA's Executive Director, Dan Shelley, this afternoon. His appearance here today couldn't come at a more critical time for journalists. So ladies and gentlemen, Dan Shelley. Thank you so much, George, and thank you, Rebecca. We're thrilled at RTDNA to be, uh, have such a strong partnership with the Society of Professional Journalists. Um, I was a little alarmed when I walked in the room and I saw the turkey that was, you guys uh, were served for lunch. So I hope we can get through this before the tryptophan kicks in. Um, but no, what we have to talk about, uh, unfortunately, uh, during the next hour or so is uh, a very serious topic. And I, I want this to be uh, a two-way conversation. I do have some remarks that I've prepared, but uh, I'm, I'm most interested in, in hearing and answering any questions you may have. Uh, about uh, the work that we at RTDNA and other groups are doing. He was just doing his job. Mike Falk, a reporter for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, was covering civil unrest that followed the acquittal of a white former police officer who had shot an unarmed African-American man. Falk was standing at an intersection near some of the protesters when police surrounded them and ordered everyone to disperse. Then, with no further warning, officers started arresting everyone in the pen that they had created. These people had nowhere to go because the police had surrounded them. Falk, who was clearly wearing press credentials, was thrown to the ground, his arms twisted behind his back, his wrists zip-tied together. One officer used his boot to pin Falk's head to the pavement, despite his continual protestations that he was just a journalist, just doing his job. One officer got right into his face, as close as he possibly could, and unleashed a strong spray of pepper spray. Falk was taken to jail where he was able to call his editor within two hours. When his editor showed up with the bail money, he was told by the police, that guy's not here. In the meantime, Falk indeed was there in jail, asking repeatedly for and repeatedly being denied medical attention for injuries he suffered during his arrest. Finally, more than 13 hours after he'd been arrested, Falk was released, but his ordeal was not over he still faces criminal charges of failure to disperse. In all, at least 10 journalists have been arrested in St. Louis during the protests that came in the wake of the officer's acquittal. One of those journalists, in fact, was arrested twice. He was just doing his job. Gothamist journalist J.P. Nicholas, right here in New York City, went to the campus of the publicly owned Bronx Community College to ask students their opinions about the fact that BCC includes the busts of Confederate generals in what it calls its campus-wide Hall of Fame. Nicholas was confronted by campus security, then the NYPD, and was told he was trespassing on public property at a public university. He was told that despite the fact BCC is a public place, it was not, quote, an open campus. He was handcuffed, arrested, and then charged with trespassing. He was just doing his job. Dan Hyman, a journalist for the Public News Service, was in a public hallway of a public building, the West Virginia State Capitol, attempting to ask then Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services, Tom Price, about efforts at that time to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. <coughs> West Virginia State Capitol Police handcuffed and arrested Hyman. He was later charged with the crime of, and this is the actual name of the crime, willful disruption of government processes. The next day, Price praised the officers who had arrested Hyman because, as the then secretary said, Hyman was not in a press conference when he was attempting to ask his questions. He was just doing his job. Nebu Solomon, a photojournalist for KLAS-TV in Las Vegas, 
was standing on a sidewalk, a sidewalk across the street from the Trump International Hotel videotaping an anti-Trump protest on tax day. He stood on that same same walk, uh, that same sidewalk, in that very same spot, dozens of times before, videotaping demonstrations at that very hotel. This time, though, for some reason, he was approached by the Las Vegas Metro Police, who told him the sidewalk on which he was standing was not, in fact, public, but was private, uh, privately owned, and that he was trespassing. He tried to tell the officers that he'd been there many times before, that he'd never been told to leave before. Then a gust of wind came up and started to topple his camera, which was on a tripod. As he reached out to grab the tripod to keep his $80,000 high-definition television camera from crashing to the ground, the officers later said they perceived that as a threat to them. <laughs> he was arrested, handcuffed, thrown to the pavement, and later charged with trespassing and the more serious charge of obstruction of an officer. They were just doing their jobs. In January, freelance journalists Alexei Wood and Aaron Cantu were covering Inauguration Day rioting in Washington, D.C. They were arrested along with the rioters and today face more than a half dozen fe federal felony charges that could put each of them in prison for 75 years. They're not scheduled to go on trial until October of next year. However, instead of acknowledging that they were journalists merely doing their jobs during the inauguration rioting, the Trump Department of Justice has doubled down, took the case to the grand jury, got the charges added to, and now they face felonies and could go to prison for 75 years just for taking photos and images of the rioters. I could go on. But listen to this. So far this year, at least 31 journalists have been arrested across the country just for doing their jobs. At least 30 journalists have been physically attacked just for doing their jobs. In May, a then congressional candidate body slammed and injured a reporter who was trying to ask him a question at a campaign event. The candidate was arrested for that assault and charged with assault, but the election occurred the next day and he won and today is serving as a member of the United States House of Representatives. In July, the U.S. Capitol Police unconstitutionally ordered reporters in a public hallway outside the U.S. Senate Gallery to delete their photos of officers arresting protesters. Also in July, the President of the United States tweeted a GIF of him physically assaulting a man with a CNN logo superimposed over his face. Then in August, he briefly retweeted a meme that showed a train plowing into a CNN reporter. Also in August, the U.S. Department of Justice announced a crackdown on government leaks, part of which includes a review of DOJ policies that discourage federal investigators from going after reporters to try to determine the source of leaks. Two days later, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, appearing on Fox News, refused to ensure that the government would not arrest reporters as part of its crackdown. Just this week, Attorney General Jeff Sessions again refused to say he would not direct the arrests of journalists simply for doing their jobs. In August, at least four journalists were assaulted by white supremacist and white nationalist protesters and by a counter-protester in Charlottesville, Virginia. Shortly after that, several journalists were roughed up by far left-wing protesters who self-identify as anarchists in Berkeley, California. So the threat is real, and the real victims are not the journalists assaulted or arrested or ordered to delete photos. The real victims are the American people. It's for them that we journalists often risk our safety to discover and share the truth. So what is the Radio Television Digital News Association doing about all this? This past winter, as George noted, we launched our Voice of the First Amendment Task Force. It has two missions, one to defend against every attack on press freedom, and second, to help the public better understand why responsible journalism is essential to their daily lives. This summer, we partnered with the Committee to Protect Journalists, the Society of Professional Journalists, and other journalism organizations to launch the nonpartisan U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, easily available online, U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, which is the archive of record for threats against press freedom. Now think about that for a minute. How many of you are familiar with the Committee to Protect Journalists? Then you know that historically, 
they have looked to other countries around the world to report on incidents in which journalists have been attacked, murdered, obstructed, arrested, otherwise threatened. This year they came to us and SPJ and other groups and said we need for the first time in our history to start monitoring attacks on reporters at home in the United States of America. We've encouraged and continue to encourage government officials and courts all over the country to uphold First Amendment rights, ensuring news media access and other protections. We've offered legal assistance to targeted journalists and news organizations. Let me tell you one quick story about that. A television station in Fort Myers, Florida, a few months ago, aired an investigative report about the unusually high unsolved murder rate in the Fort Myers area. It uses the basis for this investigative report, a U.S. Department of Justice investigation, which listed about a half dozen reasons for this unusually high number of unsolved murders. One of the six reasons, six or so reasons listed, was the prosecutorial philosophy of the local state's attorney. They interviewed the state's attorney as part of the investigative report who defended his philosophy saying, yes, it's true. Unless I'm 100% convinced that I'm going to get a conviction, I will not take a murder case to trial. They also interviewed several community activists who opposed that policy, and they listed all of the other factors that the DOJ report cited. After the report aired, the state's attorney sued the television station for defamation, not claiming that it was factually incorrect, but claiming instead, in the words of his attorney in the actual lawsuit petition, which I have read, he sued the station because the report left him with, quote, hurt feelings. <laughs> True story. RTDNA offered our Washington-based First Amendment counsel to assist that station's attorney in framing its counter arguments using the most relevant and pertinent case law. It's interesting, it's a wild world. <laughs> We've urged journalists to be completely transparent about not just what they report, but how they report it. The more members of the public understand the complexities of what we do for a living, the more likely they are to appreciate our efforts on their behalf. And we have to be. A new political morning, cons uh, morning consult poll, <coughs> you may have seen it this week, it shows that nearly half, 46% of voters across the country believe the news media fabricate stories about President Trump and his administration. 46%. And that was just one of a number of dizzying First Amendment developments this week. On Tuesday, finally, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai stated publicly that the FCC will stand for the First Amendment and not revoke the licenses of broadcast stations because of news content. It took him about a week after President Trump threatened those licenses in a tweet but at least he finally eased the concern of nervous journalists. There was also a smaller but still significant win in a North Dakota courtroom this week. Uh, one year after the arrest of journalist Sarah LaFleur Vetter, she was arrested at the Standing Rock protests near, um, in North Dakota. Uh, a judge threw out all the charges against her this week in a North Dakota courtroom. One of the attorneys in the case told the Bismarck Tribune, obviously there's concerns whenever journalists are arrested because they're not necessarily participating in a demonstration or a certain action. But in Lafleur Vetter's case, everyone was just herded and treated as a group. And that is a growing trend being used by law enforcement across the country. And particularly adept at practicing this trend is the St. Louis Police Department, to which I alluded earlier. It's a, you may have heard the term, it's a, it's a tactic called kettling, where officers will surround a group of protesters, often inadvertently catching journalists in their net, uh, and then when they have nowhere to go, order them to disperse because it's a, suddenly an unlawful assembly. They have nowhere to go because they're surrounded by the cops, so the cops then start arresting them. And often, as I said, journalists are caught in that net. RTDNA and other Press freedom groups are working hard to convince the St. Louis Police Department and St. Louis City Government to change its media relations practices. <coughs> On the negative side this week, I told you about Jeff Sessions and uh, his refusal again 
uh, to assure the American people that the federal government will not target journalists in its leak crackdown. Here's the actual exchange with Senator Amy Klobuchar, Democrat of Minnesota, this week at a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing. Klobuchar, will you commit to not putting reporters in jail for doing their jobs? Sessions. Well, I don't know that I can make a blanket commitment to that effect, but I would say this, we have not taken any aggressive action against the media at this point. But we have matters that involve the most serious national security issues that put our country at risk, and we will utilize the authorities that we have legally and constitutionally if we have to. It's the if we have to that is particularly concerning given the fact that the Justice Department is currently reviewing Obama-era DOJ rules that I described earlier. Uh, those rules, by the way, state uh, that the federal government may subpoena reporters to try to determine the identity of confidential sources only as a last resort and only if approved by the Office of the Attorney General itself. The Trump administration is reviewing those rules and you can only guess how that review will turn out. And then there's this, this interesting factoid from this week. PolitiFact reported a sharp uptick in President Trump's use of the term fake news in October so far, compared to September. Now he's still nowhere near where he was in February, his first month in office. He was off the charts in his use of the term fake news in February. Then it kind of quieted over the summer and in September and October, it's headed back up again. PolitiFact documented 153 times that he's used the term fake news in speeches, Twitter, interviews, and news conferences since he took office. And by the way, that number has now risen to 154. He used it again early this morning when he issued yet another tweet for the sixth consecutive day about the Florida Congresswoman who accused him of being insensitive to a gold star mother. By the way, that led to an alarming exchange at the White House yesterday in which White House Press uh, Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders told CBS News correspondent Chip Reed that it was highly inappropriate to question generals. She was referring to Chief of Staff, former General John Kelly, who had defended the President against the Congresswoman's attacks. So, RTDNA, as I described, is working very hard. But you have a role to play, too. A big role in helping us rebuild trust between the news media and the public. So ask yourself these questions. I know we have a lot of new professionals, some students in the room, and some seasoned professionals. All of you ask yourself these questions. Is your newsroom reporting stories that expose problems in your community, and then following up with stories about potential solutions? Have you taken steps, or has your news organization taken steps to protect the safety of your reporters and photojournalists? For example, safety courses, self-defense training, in some cases, extra security precautions for the individuals and for the news organization. About a month ago at the Excellence in Journalism Conference with which we uh, co-sponsor, uh, uh, with SBJ, we co-sponsor that conference, uh, I had the pleasure of spending part of an afternoon with CNN's Jay Tapper. Uh, he was there to speak to the conference about the First Amendment and about uh, the current uh, political and ideological environment as it relates to journalism. And accompanying Jay Tapper were two ex-Secret Service agent armed guards. Katie Turr, in her new book about reporting on the NBC's Katie Turr, in her new book about reporting on the 2016 presidential cycle notes that uh, virtually every network and national news organization now uh, provides armed security for its correspondents. Imagine that five, 10, 15 years ago. But it, so it, would, it may surprise you to know that for at least the last five or six years, news organizations in San Francisco in particular have been providing security for their crews in the field because San Francisco has a much longer history of having news crews live on the street being attacked. If you're a general manager or a news director or a print or digital editor, are you making an effort to speak to the public 
on the air, online, during speaking engagements, and during conversations with influential people in your community about the public service you regularly provide as a journalist. If you're a broadcast journalist, do your news anchors and reporters explain on the air and or on your station's website and social channels the process they go through in order to report news stories? Do you publicly discuss ethical dilemmas you face when reporting particular uh, stories and the process through which you've gone to resolve those ethical dilemmas? If you're a broadcaster, do you air public service announcements, PSAs, in which you explain the importance of what I call responsible journalism to your community? And if you're a broadcast station executive, or no one, do you do on-air editorials in which you explain your station's news gathering philosophy and commitment to serve your community? When I was in Anaheim for the Excellence in Journalism Conference with the SPJ, a local uh, LA TV reporter, this is somebody from the West Coast, not deep red middle America, showed me a photo he'd taken at a rally that he had covered in the Los Angeles area. It was a photo of a man wearing one of those infamous red baseball caps, but most important, wearing a t-shirt. And the back of that t-shirt said, tree, rope, journalist, some assembly required. The only antidote to threats on journalism and journalists is more and better journalism. The only thing at stake is the public's constitutionally guaranteed right, but even more important, need to know the truth. One of the biggest issues that has contributed to the erosion of trust between the news media and the public is the, is the public's, not everybody, but many people, the public's conflation of opinion media with responsible journalism. They watch Fox News, for example, throughout the course of the day, with the exception of Fox and Friends in the morning and in their primetime lineup featuring Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity and others. There are real honest-to-God journalists working there during the day. Uh, I've met many of them. They're not, and they too often get painted with the same brush as those talk show hosts who are opinion journalism, and it's not, I wouldn't even call it journalism. You know, I've, I've heard a lot more frequently in the last few weeks for some reason the term opinion journalism. It ain't journalism, it's opinion. And, um, but I've, I've visited the Fox News Bureau in Washington, D.C. And those guys are working, and, and women, are working very hard to do Joe Friday, Just the Facts Man journalism. And one of them, uh, somebody in that office, when I visited last in, during the summer, pulled me aside and said, look, man, you got to help us. I don't want anything to do with Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson. Didn't want anything to do with Bill O'Reilly. you got to help us explain that we do journalism here. And just this week, in the last few days, you, saw, you may have seen Chris Wallace spoke out against the Hannity's and Carlson's of Fox News uh, for bashing the media the way they, they, they do. Um, MSNBC on the other end of the political spectrum. Yeah, they have Rachel Maddow, Chris Matthews, Chris Hayes, Lawrence O'Donnell, etc. Uh, they use journalism to reinforce their point of view about issues of the day. But they're not journalists, per se. Uh, but you also have the entire NBC News organization that is helping fuel the MSNBC programming. And if you watch MSNBC during the day, you see many, many, what I call flagrant acts of responsible journalism occurring. Katie Turr, Kristen Welker, Andrea Mitchell, uh, the list goes on. All these folks who toil every day in the Capitol here in New York and all around the world, in Puerto Rico, for God's sake, and in Houston after Harvey, and after Irma, and after Nate, and Maria, of course, in, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, I mean, these are journalists doing their jobs. Saving, providing information that literally saves lives, and in some cases, physically saving lives. David Bednow, who is uh, rapidly becoming someone I have a great deal of respect for, he's a CBS News correspondent, and uh, he's not the only one, but he has made it a mission in his life. I spoke to one of his very good friends the other day 
uh, who told me that uh, he has made it the mission of his life to stay in Puerto Rico or go back as many times as CBS will let him to tell the stories of the people who were dying because of the government response to Hurricane Maria. And uh, when he was in Houston after Harvey, um, he literally saved a life. And he, there was somebody in a vehicle that had been swept away by high water near where he was, and he, he and his crew rushed over uh, and, and pulled the man to safety. That happened many times. Local reporters, network reporters. The AP did a story on reporters acting as rescuers uh, during Harvey, and, and David Begno's quote was, yeah, I'm a journalist, but I'm a human being too. And I've strayed far afield from your original question, but uh, I, I get worked out, worked up, huh, I get worked up about this stuff, and, and feel the need to lash out about um, how journalists are actually providing such a valuable service to communities all across the country. Also in Houston, after Harvey, uh, a reporter for the local ABC affiliate there helped a woman deliver her newborn son. She was trapped in the, in the floodwaters, went into labor. He said, I'm not a doctor, but I'm a father, so I thought I might be able to do something. And because of him and a couple of other folks, that woman is now enjoying the first few months of her son's life. So those are flagrant acts of humanity and flagrant acts of responsible journalism.